All right, we are going to begin the refutation of this professional liar, John MacArthur. And keep in mind that his church building thing has no basis at all in the Bible. All right, none. Uh, we are going to be showing that in this little study here. So he's the burden of proof is on him, and he never proves his point, which we will show. So here we go. It seems as though every eight or nine, ten years, I am struck again by how confused people are about the church and what the church is. And it almost needs to be redefined again. I think we're at that kind of time now. It's been a number of years since we have explicitly looked at what the Word of God says about the church. Okay. Uh, now what he'll do is he'll give you what the Word of God actually says. You're going to see it in this. He'll give you what the Word of God says, that it's the people, it's not a building. There's no church buildings in the entire New Testament. But then he'll flip it and he'll make it the building as well. See, this guy's a professional liar. He'll tell you we need to be submissive to the Word of God. He doesn't believe in the Word of God. Ask him. Ask him if he holds, if he can hold up a perfect copy of God's written word. Doesn't have one. Ask him. Ask him. If you're one of his church members, ask him. He doesn't have one. Let's continue. We are the church. We live as the church. We are the living, breathing church of Jesus Christ. So we understand our own life. And we understand it clearly as we have endeavored to pattern it after the Word of God, but there are so many who, who don't understand. Over the last few years, about 2,000 of you have become members of Grace Church, and you have added your life to the lives of all those who previously have become members of our church. And by becoming a member, you have said, I'm going to make a full commitment of my life to this congregation. You have, by the power of God, been added to the church. The Lord adds to His church. He adds to His church, but even those whom He adds to the church sometimes, in fact, more frequently than ever, don't openly, publicly declare themselves as a part of His church. Popular. So the Lord can add you to the church, but you're not publicly be becoming part of the church. Yeah. Okay. See, again, he's confusing this thing. This guy is a professional liar. That's what he's done for his whole life. He's a, he's a very, very wicked false prophet. And what he'll do is he speaks very, very veiled, very confusing ways and things. The church is the living body of Christ, but it's this place here as well. You have asked the average person in that congregation, are you in church right now? Yes. When you go home, will be will you be in church? They'll say, no. That's the problem with these buildings, these pagan buildings. But let's continue. Another thing to say, you have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus. But there's a real disconnect when you say, I have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus, but no personal relationship with His church. What? You can say, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, but no personal relationship with His church. See, where's this stuff in Scripture? See, He's creating His own system here. This is Catholicism. This is the Counter-Reformation. Is the guy a Jesuit? I have no idea. I have no idea. I'm not claiming that he is a Jesuit. I have no proof of that. But what I'm saying is, for the for the people to be brought back to Rome, they have to get them into church buildings. You can't have people apart from church buildings. You can't control them when they're away from these buildings. And you'll see him ripping on the thing of personal relationship with Jesus Christ, just like the Pope did. See, Pope Francis came out. I'm not going to play the video. You can look it up. Um, but Pope Francis came out, uh, I think, 2016, I think it was, and he said, uh, 
you know, publicly stated that it's not a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It's your membership in his church. What John MacArthur say? I really want to address that because I think that's a fabrication and a deception that has found a place in the thinking of many professing Christians today. Many of you are members of Grace Community Church and you have poured your life and soul into this church as believers must. Others of you come regularly or irregularly, sporadically. Some of you may be just visiting us for the first time or in recent times you've started attending. But you're really on the outside looking in. So you can have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, but you're really not right with God until you're part of a church. You see? And and you know, you're just on the outside looking in. You know, you're you might be just a professing Christian. I don't know if you're really saved until you're part of the church. Let's continue. You haven't identified, you haven't made a commitment, you don't see your relationship to local congregation as an absolute necessity, you haven't committed to faithful involvement. <laughs> your uh, involvement in a local community and, and everything. Okay, um, what if that uh, local community is not following the scriptures? What if they're following a man that's teaching heresies and lies. Oh, you, you just have to be part of it then. You just have to go there and submit to it. No, you don't. No, you don't. That is not what the Bible teaches. Let's continue. And it probably is due to some natural forces that are working against the spiritual forces that the Spirit of God is operating in your life. And you need to understand what, what is right, what you need to do. For the sake of those who are not members and looking in from the outside, and for the sake of those of you who are new members and maybe don't understand all that's involved in that, I, I want to make sure that I've discharged my responsibility as your shepherd to help you understand the church. And this morning I'm just going to give a, a personal uh, overview of the church and then over the weeks that unfold after this we'll dig down into some of the glorious details. <laughs> glorious details. And he's our shepherd. Okay. Now I understand that a, a preacher is supposed to be there to care for the souls of his people and things like that. And, and in a sense you're kind of a shepherd. but. If you really get right down to it, this guy has no higher authority on earth than himself. He has no Bible that he believes is perfect. He interprets the scriptures and changes the scriptures and says whatever he wants about the scriptures. So, you know, you'll see that. He just makes up statements and no scripture and this is what the New Testament teaches. You know, it's like, you'll, you'll see. Let's continue. Of the church. I need to speak to you as the shepherd that the Lord has given you for my sake and to discharge my responsibility before the Lord and for yours as well so that you can be fully blessed by being fully responsive. And it's been a number of years since I've done this. Now let's kind of begin at the beginning. We all understand that God is sovereign, that He rules. We even know the terminology, God is the great king over his kingdom. But there are two ways to understand the kingdom of God. One is universal and one is particular. God is a king over his, the king over his universal kingdom in the sense that he rules the universe throughout time and eternity and he rules therefore all that is in his universe. He rules singularly as the triune God. No one can thwart his rule. No one can inform his rule. 
No one can alter his rule. No one can withstand the power of the execution of his will. He is the king over everything. This is repeatedly displayed in the Old Testament. In verses like Psalm 103:19, the Lord has established His throne in the heavens, and His sovereignty rules over all. Okay, let me just get that quick. Psalm 103, verse 19. Um, he doesn't use the King James Bible. He uses one of the many Vatican versions, and oftentimes he doesn't even use that. He just kind of creates his own. So 103, 19. Um, the Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom ruleth over all. Okay. So I just want to clarify that, make sure we get the word of God here, not his Vatican versions that he likes to use. Let's get back to it here. That sums it up. He rules over all, all that exists in his universe. That is his universal kingdom. He rules in the sense that he ordains all that is going on in the entire created realm. Angels, the natural universe, the spiritual universe, angels, demons, all persons. He rules over all of them. But there is another understanding of the kingdom of God that is more important for us at this moment, and that is the kingdom of God that is particular. By that we mean God's rule over His redeemed people. He rules over His redeemed people in a separate way. He orders all of the universe. He controls all of the universe, but there are in the universe inanimate non-persons. There are in the universe demons who experience no blessing from God. There are in the universe people, human beings, who experience the judgment of God, even the judgment of God everlastingly in hell. Now notice there he said that people go to hell, they experience the judgment of God in hell. You'll hear him later on cover up for the word hell and he uses Hades, you know, or Hades. That's something else. Let's continue. We're talking about a different kingdom. The particular kingdom where God rules over his redeemed people. Those that have been forgiven of their sin, those that have been delivered from transgression and therefore from guilt and therefore from judgment and therefore from punishment and therefore from eternal hell and have the promise of everlasting heaven. His kingdom in its present form over His redeemed people on earth is the church. When you read in the Bible about... Okay, and you're going to see the big heresy coming up here when you read in the Bible about... Okay, but... Uh, the church is never called the kingdom, right? Let me let me just point that out. Uh, nowhere in the Pauline epistles are we ever called the kingdom, right? So he just lied. The first of, you know, well not the first, but he's going to be lying throughout the thing. The church is called the kingdom. No, it's not. No, it's not. This is Roman Catholic teaching: the temporal and the spiritual. The temporal means that they have the sword that they can go out conquering and things like that. And you will hear him say later on, too, he calls the church, the, it's the church militant, totally Roman Catholic. But listen to what he says here. The kingdom of heaven, or the kingdom of God, in terms of this world, it is the church. The church is that kingdom. Ooh, ooh, the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God, that's referring to the church. Really. Let's check out the verse here. Matthew chapter 11, verse 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. This is talking about the 
kingdom of heaven, the millennial kingdom that will be coming one day. Jesus Christ is talking about it here, and he says that the kingdom of heaven suffer the violence, and the violent take it by force. What is this? The headquarters of it is in Jerusalem. That is the kingdom of heaven. So when this guy is saying, you know, oh, it's the, the kingdom of heaven is, is the church there. Well, then we have to be taking things violently by force. He's referring to Roman Catholicism is what he's doing. Making you think that he's a Christian pastor. And he's not. Absolutely not. The guy's a sick individual. So yeah, the kingdom of heaven is the church. See? Kingdom builder. Bloody killer. Let's continue. Yes, there will be a future reign of Christ on the earth the millennial kingdom for a thousand years that the Bible talks about. There is the eternal reign of God and of Christ over the redeemed in the new heaven and the new earth everlastingly. That too is the eternal kingdom in which God rules over all of His redeemed, then perfected and brought into His presence forever. But for now, we live in the kingdom of God in its earthly form, which is His redeemed church. Yeah. The Lord is our master. The Lord Jesus, we have confessed Him as Lord and Master. He is our King. He is the King over the church. He is the head of the church, the true church. Those who are regenerated, justified, being sanctified, and will one day be glorified. You, if you have confessed Jesus as Lord, have a... Okay. Lordship salvation there, by the way. He is a true Lordship salvationist. You have to confess Jesus as Lord. He has to be there. You have to do all this, you know, things and stuff to, to stay saved, essentially. And it will say that later on. Being saved. All right. Quits his Vatican version. He's a papist. Okay? Closet papist. I've been saying this for a while. These guys are going to start to come out of the confessional. All right. I mean, it, I know how these guys set this stuff up. They they start to move in the direction of Rome, and they, but they're very careful not to be Catholic. But then as time goes by, they, they just do a little bit more, a little bit more. Eventually it'll be, I was wrong all these years. The Roman Catholic Church is the one true church. That's where he's going. And by the way, the kingdom of God, and uh, let me show you the scripture here. I want to minimize my sword searcher thing Romans chapter 14 I'll show you what the kingdom of God is uh, let's see can't think of which verse it is okay Romans 14 verse 17 for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost okay it's a spiritual thing right now it is not a physical kingdom. And by the way, if you have a physical kingdom, then you build physical church buildings. You got to have that wealth to show your the power of your kingdom. Let's continue. Acknowledged him as your sovereign king. And you have therefore declared yourself to be a part of his kingdom, and it's not just your declaration, it is the very declaration of heaven itself. If you are a true believer in Jesus Christ, you are in his kingdom. He is your sovereign king. That's the church. Okay, let me just say this real quick too. He keeps using the word sovereign, you see, because he's a Calvinist. The word sovereign is not a King James Bible word. Just need to point that out. You live in that sphere. You are no longer a citizen of this world. You are an alien in this world and you are a citizen of the kingdom by being a part of the church. I just want you to understand the church is where you live and move and have your being. This is Catholicism. I mean this is Catholicism. You're not a citizen of whatever country you live in. You're a citizen of the church. This is Roman Catholicism people what he's teaching. It's where you live. It's where you love. It's where you learn. 
It's where you worship. It's where you serve. And it gets worse. You know, yes, yeah, it's, it's all those things. And again, no one in the crowd is thinking, well, I'm in the church all the time. When I go home, I'm still in the church. No. Every single one of them is thinking of the building. I guarantee you. And he's guilt tripping people because they're not coming and being part of his church there or some other church. They're referring to the building. This is Catholicism. This is not scriptural. The church is your life. It is your breath. It is your blood. The church has your soul. It has your heart. It has your mind. And it has your body as well. <laughs> you got to love the little stage acting voice. I mean, you can't just talk like I'm talking right now. You have to say, the church is your body. It is your blood. And it is your life. <laughs> you know, your little, little act. You know, these guys are trained for that in their seminaries. It's what they, I forget the, it's homiletics, I think is what it is. You know, you get these great homilies, these great speeches, and you have to do your voice a special way and everything else. But you know, the church is all this stuff and everything. It is, it is everything. You know? Make sure you give your tithe, you know. You gotta get that money. Let's continue. The church is your nation. The church is your country. The church is your state. The church is your city. The church is your tribe. The church is your ethnicity. The church. The church is your ethnicity. Excuse me. Um. So when we get saved, let's just go with this for a minute. When you get saved, you give up your ethnicity. Really? I understand we're all one in Christ Jesus according to Galatians chapter 3, but we give up our ethnicity. And the church is your city? I read about a city over in Revelation chapter 17 that reigned over the kings of the earth. Hmm. Wouldn't be the same one I'm sure that John MacArthur would be referring to because of. Yeah. Let's continue. The church is your family. The church is the realm of your most essential and all-satisfying relationships. Yeah. That was made clear when you were delivered from this present world. When you were transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear Son. The church is your life. You don't love the world, you love the church. That's who you are as a Christian. The church is not something you do on Sunday. The church is where you live your entire life and where all your essential needs and purest desires and holy aspirations and longings are met. Mm -hmm. On a personal note, I love the church. I love the church everywhere and uh, everywhere I have gone over the years around the world and met with the people of God, those who are part of the redeemed church. Everywhere I have gone to fellowship with those in the eternal heavenly kingdom, I have expressed and received that love. Doesn't matter whether it's in the jungle of South America or whether it's with the Maori in New Zealand or whether it's in Asia, whether it's with believers in China, whether it's in Europe, wherever it might have been. But the Roman Catholic Church could be there too. Across this planet, Africa, I love the church. And no matter where I go, even with people I've never met, there is a bond of love. Those are my people. That's my nation. That's my tribe. That's my family. I have loved the church really all my life. Since a little child. It is where my parents first took me 
right after I was born. His parents first took him right after he was born. So he's talking to, about a building. You see? Of course he's talking about a building. It's where I, I first heard the Word of God preached by my grandfather and my father. It's where I was first taught the stories of the Bible, which even to this day are vivid in my mind. It's where I sat in a very little chair and had a very, very big teacher tell me stories out of the Word of God and call me to trust in Jesus Christ. Sunday school. No scripture to support it. Show it to me. Show me one verse of scripture that says anybody but a parent should be teaching the child. No scripture. Sunday school is completely wrong, completely wicked. Again, I have a whole sermon on that, but let's continue. It's where I came to believe the Bible and then to believe the gospel. Mm -hmm. It's where I learned to worship. It's where I learned to sing the songs of the redeemed, beginning in their most simple forms as a child. It's where I learned to serve the Lord. It's where I learned to love and be loved by the saints. Church is the place my whole life where I've made all my friends. Church is the place where I met Patricia, God's best gift to me. Church is the place I raised my children. Church is the place where my grandchildren are. It is to the church that I have given my whole life without a split second of regret. What a privilege. The church is my life, has been my life, will be my life forever. Because we're all going to be together in glory. Along the way, the Lord called me to be a pastor, and then He called me here. And I have tried to teach you to love not only Christ, but to love the church. I don't think it was the Lord that called it. Okay. I think it was the God of this world. And I don't think I'm going to be spending eternity with this liar. All right, let's continue. And I've also tried to raise up other men and women in leadership who could teach others to love the church. I've tried to raise up young men through the seminary and the Master's University, and young women, wherever, to love the church. I, I've had a lifelong love for the church that I want to share. We have a shepherd's conference to try to help men love the church more and train God's people to love the church more. My Christian experience has never been about law. It's always been about love. It's never been about rules. It's always been about affections. It's always been that I love the Lord and I love who the Lord loves. I love the church. And I've tried to teach you over these many decades to love the Lord and to love His church. And you are good students. You have come to love the church. I see it in your faithfulness. I see it in your sacrifice. I see it in your giving. I see it in your... <laughs> see it in your giving. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Love of money is the root of all evil, you know? There you go. What's he when you would agree with that? It's, oh, it's a King James. That's not correct. It's, you know, a root of all kinds of evil or something. Or the Greek is, you know, yeah, sure. You know, but he sees their love for the church in their giving. Got to build that big building. You're serving. I see it in your joy. And all I have ever desired in service to the Lord was that the church would love Him and love whom He loves. I just got to pause it again there just because I need to make a point here. These guys do this all the time. Every Bible building I've ever been to. There is this, there is the secret little click that's there, where the hireling up front—that's what these guys are—they're there for the money. Um, the hireling up front will speak to his little special click, and he'll give them little you know promotion things from the pulpit, and he'll be like you know they're 
I've seen your love and he, and he speaks to them and stuff like that to make them feel oh he's talking to us and everything else you know I've been faithful here and everything every single one of these buildings I've ever gone to they have their special little inner circle their little special click the pastor's little faithful few every single time let's continue I want you to understand the church I don't want you to have any vague ideas about the church or your necessary relation to the church. I want necessary relation to the church. You're required to come. I want you to be able to fully love the Lord and the church. And so, again, after many years, I want to go back and talk about the church. I believe that our Lord deserves the love that He demands for Himself. And I believe He deserves the love that He demands for His church. And in all honesty, I am greatly disturbed with the popular idea that you can have a personal relationship with Christ and be detached from the church. Ooh exactly what the Pope said. He's greatly disturbed by the, the, the thing, of this teaching that you can have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and be detached from the church. Uh, well, what the Bible teaches is that the body of Christ is the church. Okay, The people are the church. So it's not possible to be detached from the church. See, what he's doing here as a professional master liar, he's saying that the church is the building. You have to come to a local church. You have to be there. No scripture for that. Not one verse of scripture that says local church in your King James Bible. Okay, he uses the Vatican version. But the point is, there's not one verse of scripture that talks about them building a building and you have to come and be part of it. Not one verse. All right. I am connected to every saved believer out there, whether I like them or not. All right. That is a fact. Why? Because I'm in, I'm saved. I have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, which makes me part of the church absolutely but to say that I have to have a local fellowship or something like this that I come and I'm, I'm part of all the time and everything else uh, there's no scripture for that especially when quote-unquote local churches are doing things that are totally contrary to scripture I mean if I would if I knew some brethren in the area and things like that that we could meet occasionally or something fine whatever I've done that in the past we had a house church, and I've been part of the whole church building thing, too. But, you know, again, he's trying to force people to come into unbiblical situations and then question your salvation if you don't. Let's continue. That is just a very odd and unacceptable disconnect. Like saying I'm connected to the head but not to the body. Makes no sense. Yeah, but he's making the body into a church building. See? He's a heretic. But it is becoming increasingly popular to say, I have a personal relationship with Christ, but no real relationship to the church. Then I would say immediately, your relationship with Jesus Christ is far from what it ought to be. Because loving him and not loving his church is not acceptable to him. Rarely do I hear people talk about commitment to the church, love for the church, devotion to the church, even covenanting to be faithful to the church, joining the church, being a member of the church. We have some trend. Okay, let me just pause there again. You have covenanting with the church, joining the church, being a member of the church. Scripture, chapter and verse. He's not giving anything. Okay. I mean, he, he quoted, what, one verse of Scripture? You know, here in 18 minutes. It wasn't even the King James Bible, some new version. Not giving any Scripture for this. Understand, Christian, when you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you are part of the church. Period. Wherever you are, you are in church. Do you understand that? 
it's fine to meet with other believers and things like that and to fellowship with other believers. But to say when I'm not with other believers, I'm no, no longer in the church is satanic heresy. You're in the church all the time. The church is the body of Christ. See, he's turning. He's this guy. Just This isn't the Holy Spirit leading this man. He's just twisting things and, and just insane. Let's continue. Ends that the culture is imposing upon us that drive people away from this commitment. Trends, I guess you could put them under a couple of titles. One would be ecclesiastical consumerism, where I have a personal relationship with Christ and, and I sort of live my Christian life uh, based upon whatever appeals to me. I'm over here, I'm over there, I'm here, I'm there, I'm bouncing around and shopping my Christianity. No long-term relationships, no deep devotion, no lasting spiritual dynamics among the people of God with whom I live. I'm a shopper. I'm a consumer. And that's the world we live in. And I consume my Christianity in the doses and the forms that appeal to me. It's about... Okay. Uh, isn't that what he's doing? If you went there to his Babel building and you started to say, hey, Calvinism is of the devil, do you think he'd say, well, you know, that's, that's good. Yeah, stay here and I'll put you into teaching this. Of course not. He'd be like, out the door. Stinking hypocrite. Just ticks me off. You know, if you, if you say, I don't want to be part of this, your wickedness, because there's no basis for it in Scripture, you know, I read my Bible and I'm not seeing anything that you're doing in there, you know, and stuff. Where's the suit and tie at? Where's the pulpit? Where's the red lights coming behind? Where's the one man pastor? Where's the stuff at? It's, oh, you're shopping around. You're just picking and choosing what you want. No, I'm living by the pages of Scripture and doing things according to the Word of God. But that's heretical. You can't have that. See, these guys, they hate the idea of Christians having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Because then you can get out from underneath their authority. They don't like that. They don't like scriptures that talk about one mediator between God and men. The man, Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ is your head. Not this satanic liar. Let's continue. About me. You can go so far as to create your own media religion. You have the music that you want to listen to on your iPhone or whatever other device you use. You have the preaching that you want to listen to available to you. You download that. You can download bits and pieces of your own basic smorgasbord choice and create your own religion. That's, That's exactly what he's done. <laughs> Funny. Becoming increasingly popular sort of personalized media church. Another thing that I think is very threatening to the reality of life in the church is cyber church auditing the church from a distance. Auditing the church from a distance. We are to the I don't go to church, but, but I, I tune in live stream or I listen on the radio or my church is on TV. <laughs> As he's broadcasting. Okay. That's not even close to fulfilling what the Lord expects out of a believer. What happens with ecclesiastical consumers and cyber church people and self-styled media religionists is that they neglect all that a church really is. And that starts with they neglect the ordinances, baptism the regular time at the Lord's table, corporate worship. Okay, the regular time at the Lord's table. All right, uh, chapter and verse. Show me where it says that you're supposed to take communion as a regular time. Show it to me. Tell me, show me in the King James Bible where it gives a specific time for when you should have communion. Show me. And 
corporate worship in a church building? Chapter and verse, please. Of course not. Are you kidding me? He doesn't need it. He is his own God. Mutual ministry, service. They also avoid accountability. Ooh, here's, a, here's one of the favorite ones of the Babel Buildingites. Who are you accountable to? Uh, here's a thought. The Lord. Okay. Oh, yes, but you need to be accountable to other Christians. Okay, can I choose who I'm accountable to? I guarantee you, he doesn't believe that he's accountable to me. And yet I'm saved. I'm in ministry. But he wouldn't believe for one second that he's accountable to me. You see, you can circle yourself, you can you can find your little special clique of friends that you are accountable to because they all agree with you. This, this thing of, oh, you need to be accountable to other Christians. That's another scam of this whole system. Let's continue. They're living in the world of their own, and it's a world that essentially makes them anonymous. Let me tell you something about sin. If you're a believer, sin wants you alone. Sin wants you alone. Okay. Um, let me get you a scripture on this here quickly. Sin wants you alone. Okay, Johnny. Galatians chapter 1 verse 15, But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me. But I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. And after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him fifteen days. Oh, sin wants you alone. Paul was certainly a sinner there, you know, I mean, he was just... Incredible. Just uh, it's making me sick. Let's continue. Oh, we have some replacement events for the church. You can go to places with big crowds on a Sunday, and uh, lots of folks will flow in there. They'll turn the lights off, and then they'll turn on the strobe lights, and there'll be a bunch of wild music. That's the pseudo church, that's an event. That's a repeated event that is intended to replace the church, and generally speaking, it mocks the church as out of touch with the culture, out of touch with what people want. And very often that pseudo-church has a pseudo-pastor. It's really very little more than a sort of personality cult or personality club. <laughs> He's just condemning himself. He's shooting himself in the foot. But see again, they'll they'll preach in a way that they'll you know get the people controlled under their control, and they'll make them think you're not part of that. You're not here in a personality cult, you know. And yet I can guarantee you the guy doesn't hang around afterwards, and he doesn't know probably you know probably a very few people in his Babel building there probably even get to talk to him in person. It's not a personality cult though. Ever. It's all about style, all about entertainment. Here's the thought. Wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be just wonderful if somebody came to you, and it could happen to any or all of us, and said, I have just come to faith in Christ. I'm looking for a church. And you could say, really? There's one over there. There's one on that corner. Just find some place that says church. Go there. You'll be fine. Just look for a place marked church. And you'll be safe. And you'll be blessed. Now you know you can't say that. You'd be afraid to say that. You'd think you'd be guilty before God for saying that because you could send somebody to a church that would destroy them. Now, you might be able to say that 
If you were in a country where Christians had long been seriously persecuted, true Christians were being persecuted so that false Christianity gets driven out and the only churches might be hard to find, but they would be real churches and you could say, go there. But that's not true in our culture. Wouldn't it be wonderful if... And I can remember as a, as a child, growing up and being in a lot of different churches, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could say, like we used to be able to say, find a church? Because all churches follow the Lord and all churches honor the Bible and all churches are where you can worship Christ. Just find a church. Find a gathering of Christians. You'll be okay. Because wherever Christians gather, you'll find sound doctrine, true worship, discernment, true love, true holiness, humility, joy, godly shepherds, and gospel witness. Really. You can't say that. In fact, immediately when somebody asks you that question, you get defensive. And you feel like you've got to protect this person, right? You can't go there. Don't go there. Don't. Look, between here and the freeway, don't go anywhere but here. <laughs> I can just tell you. You can't say that. You can't say that. Why is it so hard? Why, why do we get mail and constantly, I can't find a faithful church? After all, it's... Okay, um, show you some scripture on that real quick. Why can't I find a faithful church? Uh, let me look it up here real quick. It's actually chapter 5. It's just amazing to me how this guy you know, is able to say this. Let me just look it up here quickly. Okay. Acts chapter 5, verse 38. Now I say unto you, refrain from these men and let them alone. For if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it, lest haply ye be ye found even to fight against God. All right. Um, Church buildings come to naught. They come to nothing because they're not of God. Yeah. Absolutely. Let's continue. It shouldn't be difficult. What does uh, Scripture say a church is? Well, here's what it says. The church is heaven on earth. Chapter and verse. The church is heaven on earth. It doesn't say that. It's going to be a heavenly experience brought down to earth. <laughs> okay. Uh, read the, the New Testament. There's fighting and contention and things like that, and people being cast out, and, stuff, and that's heaven on earth. And, you know, one of the marks of a false prophet is when you get a guy like this and just run in his mouth and everything else, he should be saying, okay, turn your Bible to the book of chapter and verse. See? Turn your Bible here, turn your Bible there get the people to turn in their Bibles. She's not doing that. Let's continue. It's not going to be anything like the world. The church is, is going to be the place where you hear the truth proclaimed, because the church is the pillar and foundation of divine truth. It's the gathering of true worshipers, worshiping in spirit and truth. Okay. The Bible says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Hey, John MacArthur, what is the word of God? Absolute truth. Hold it up and show it to us. The one that doesn't need to be updated or changed. The perfect written word of God. Hold it up. Show it to your congregation. He doesn't believe in any such book. I do. King James Bible. Why? Superior manuscripts. Okay? traces back to Antioch. It doesn't come from the Roman Catholic Church. Majority of manuscripts line up with this book and the testimony and study the doctrine of this book and compare it to the doctrines of the new versions. But he calls somebody like me a cult, you know, member, maybe even a leader. Yeah, you never know. <laughs> Let's continue. 
It's a collection of God-glorifying, Christ-honoring saints, fellowshipping in love and service to their King and to each other. It's people literally burning with a passion for holiness and Christ-likeness. Yeah, right. People burning for a passion. You go to the average church building, and, and I can guarantee in his place, 99% of the people don't even want to talk about the Bible after the service is over. If you start talking about scripture, you're looked at as kind of a little bit weird. You know, I mean, we need to talk about the Super Bowl. We need to talk about the weather. We need to talk about our jobs. We need to talk about everything and anything except the Bible. Burning with a passion for God's word. <laughs> a church is a fellowship where the superficial is replaced by the supernatural and where carnal desires are replaced by spiritual desires. That's a church. A church, I think, is defined by its desires. The best definition of boredom that I ever read is this. Boredom is the desire for desire. When you've reached the point where you don't want anything, that's boredom. That can't be true of a Christian. I don't need to be entertained. That's not what I desire. I have desires, very strong desires. They're holy aspirations and holy affections. And the place where my deepest and most lasting and penetrating desires are all fulfilled is in the life of the church. Nothing outside the church satisfies my desires. Because those desires are cultivated in the new creation and by the work of the Holy Spirit. I could never be bored. I could never be bored because my desires are strong toward God and strong toward Christ and strong toward the Holy Spirit and strong toward the Word of God and therefore... Strong toward the Word of God. What is the Word of God? You see, He keeps lying to people. He keeps wanting people to believe that He actually believes in and trusts His Bible. He doesn't. Strong towards the Word of God. He doesn't believe anything of the kind. He's a liar. He's a professional liar. Let's continue. Inseparable from life in the church. If you don't have a particular strong interest in the church, you better do a little inventory on what you desire. The world can suck you up and you can desire a whole lot of things that will intrude on and curtail what you really ought to desire, the things that can only be satisfied with a full commitment to the church. Not a personal relationship, but you have to have a full commitment to the church. That's really important. Um, I can't ask for a show of hands because you know, obviously I can't see your hands out there, but how many of you out there have experienced just a powerful move of the, of the Lord in your life by leaving these wicked buildings? And isn't it neat when you meet another Christian of like mind that's also left this satanic system that's pulled out of a social club that, I mean, they're social clubs at best, you know, false convert you know, conversion uh, temples uh, at the worst, okay? You know, let's just say everybody's saved in a building there. They come together for social, you know, functions, and that's it, you know? And that, of course, they're not saved. I mean, a lot of these people are just completely lost in these buildings, most of them, you know? But you get away, you get in that personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you spend time in the Word and everything else, and you meet another Christian like that, it's just instant fellowship, it's just, it's amazing. You feel that bond of the Holy Spirit. You don't feel it in these buildings. You come together and you talk about worldly things. Let's continue. I can't get here enough. I can't get here fast enough. I can't stay long enough. Because it's in the communion of the saints in the life of the church that all my highest and best desires are satisfied. Okay, see? 
Again, it's not I'm in the church all the time. I can't get here fast enough. He's talking about the building. You say, oh no, no, it's it's the people when they come together and stuff like that. It's the people. That's still a problem. See? Because if you feel disconnected from the Lord when you are by yourself, there's a major problem there. Now, when we hear about contemporary churches today, we hear words like this, radical. We are a radical church, or we are a transformational church, or we are an extreme church, or we are um, an awesome church, or we are an emergent church, or we are an alternative church, or we are an innovative church, or we are, I've even seen, an explosive church. Really. Okay. Now, see, what he's going to do here is another little mind control tactic that these hirelings will use is they'll use the extreme opposite end of the spectrum the whole emergent satanic movement you know the, all these radical charismatic um, people and things and they'll say if you're not in church then you're one of those see little agenda there continue see if I'm right I don't need high energy I don't need high emotion. I don't need creativity. I don't need cultural savvy. I do not need to be entertained. Those are not my desires. If you're chasing high energy and entertainment, you're running from the church. I don't need a radical, contemporary, transformational, extreme, awesome, emergent, alternative, innovative, explosive church. I don't need that. I just need an ordinary church. There is an ordinary church. There is an ordinary church. Again, the little, little tactic here where you repeat things, and you repeat it, and you repeat it. Again, this is, this is hypnotism, okay? You repeat the same phrase, and you change the tone of your voice and things. Crazy. I just wish churches were ordinary so that we could say to people, just pick one. It used to be a lot more ordinary when I was young. And now churches can be the most dangerous place in the community. So what is an ordinary church? What do you mean an ordinary church? I mean a normal, customary, regular, common, ordinary church. Chapter and verse. What would that be like? Well, here we go. You'd have a saved congregation. <laughs> You'd have a saved congregation. I've never been to one Babel building where every member was saved. Never one. A saved congregation. That's a church. And, and again, let me just say this. A saved congregation, that's a church. Okay. Um, every single one of these Babel buildings that's out there welcomes lost people in to sit among the saved Every single one of them does it. Let's continue. They would be subject to the authority of Scripture. Subject to the authority of Scripture. He doesn't believe the Scripture. He doesn't believe in any Bible being perfect. He will regularly, you know, hold up a ESV or a New King James or whatever else, and well, it's it's the Word of God as it, you know, where it's properly translated, and oh, the Nestle's text has been updated, so we should update it, and and it should, you know, this continuing work of updating it and updating it and updating it. Is it perfect yet? No, we just have to update it more. It's like you go to a car mechanic and you say, "Is my car fixed?" No, just keep bringing it back. I'm gonna have to fix it each time you bring it back. There's a sense in which it'll never be running correctly. Gladly. They would be led by mature, godly pastors and teachers. They would be devoted to sound doctrine and serious theology. Their worship would be elevated. 
beautiful and have a tone of seriousness. Let me just pause it there again for a minute. The worship would be elevated, beautiful, and have a tone of seriousness. Uh, I remember the Babel building I was raised in, it was a pretty big one, and um, they would actually make people audition before they could sing in the choir. And if your voice wasn't beautiful, then uh, sorry, we can't use you. You can't bring glory to the Lord with your voice if it's not beautiful. Chapter and verse on that one. They would be constantly in prayer. They would hold strong convictions based on sound doctrine. They would be spiritually discerning. They would be protective of God's flock, protecting them from all sin and error. They would be pursuing holiness and humility, loving each other sacrificially, discipling one another, and proclaiming Christ by corporate testimony and individual witness. That's the church. That's an ordinary church. Just ordinary. That's what Scripture says the church should be. That's what Scripture says a church should be, really. Uh, why didn't you turn to it then and read it? Show us the Scriptures. Hasn't showed any. Try to find one. Not easy. By the sweet providence of the Lord, here's one that ascribes to God the glory and seeks to be this kind of church. Seeks to be this kind of church. No. Yeah. <laughs> We've always wanted to be just an ordinary church. We have an extraordinary Lord, but we want to be an ordinary church. The Lord is extraordinary because there's one of Him. We're ordinary because there should be thousands of us. Why aren't there? All these people that He's trained up and everything else, where's the revival? Where's the great move of the Lord? There's more church building now than ever before. Where's the great move of the Lord if the Lord's behind this whole system? He's not. We don't want to be known for uniqueness. We don't want to be known for cleverness. We don't want to be known for innovation. We don't want to be known for our ability to adapt to the culture. We just want to be the ordinary church doing what our extraordinary Lord desires so that all the glory goes to Him. Now, so what is your responsibility or commitment to the ordinary church? You have one here. So what's your relationship to this church? Is it marginal? Is it sporadic? Is it indifferent? Or is it full commitment? This is your family. These are your people. This is the kingdom in which you live. <laughs> it's the kingdom in which you live. Yeah. Unreal. Even in the book of Acts, they knew the church. Three thousand people are converted on the day of Pentecost. How did they know? They counted them. They knew who they were. Later on in the few chapters in the book of Acts, five thousand more added to the church. You come into chapter six and they're already trying to figure out how to minister to the needs of certain widows and then they've got men who teach and men who can oversee those ministries that are called deacons. The church begins to have to care for its people. And all through the pattern of the New Testament, the church is expressing its love for the Lord by demonstrating its love for each other. And the apostles write letters to the church to inform the church and to inform church leaders of those things that are critical for the life of the church. Members were tracked in the book of Acts. If you went from one and Sydney to another, there were letters of commendation which you took with you. Members were tracked. Okay. Uh, 
letters of commendation. Okay, that's kind of odd. So that that. Okay, here we go. He just said they needed letters of commendation. Second Corinthians three one. Do we begin again to commend ourselves, or need we as some others epistles of commend? Con commendation to you or letters of commendation from you ye are our epistles writ epistle written in our hearts known and read of all men he's not saying that they needed them he's actually cutting on that and saying we don't need letters of commendation but this liar this deceiver right here he just said that they did members were tracked this from a man that says that people in the time of Jacob's trouble can take the mark of the beast Members are tracked. Who's creeped out? Raise your hand right now. Yeah. Crazy. Continue. A new group of believers would know you were a Christian and you would come with the commendation of a church in another place. No, you wouldn't. Paul talks about those letters of commendation. New Testament letters. Paul talks about those letters of commendation. Read the verse. Turn it, tell the people, turn in your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Let's start in verse 1. He doesn't do it. Why? Because if people read it, they would see that Paul is, is making fun of the thing. We don't need letters of commendation. You are our epistles. This guy's wicked. I'm telling you what. It's written to churches. Paul's letters are written to churches or to pastors of churches, case of Timothy and Titus. The general epistles of Peter and James were written to believers collectively. Uh, the, the general epistles of uh, Peter and James were written to believers collectively. Collectively. Okay. You didn't have it. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. James is writing to the twelve tribes, not believers. Unreal. This guy's such a stinking heretic. Let's continue. Have a personal relationship with Christ without a personal relationship with the church if you were living then because the only way you heard from God was when a letter came that was inspired by the Holy Spirit and read to the church. The only way you heard from God was when it, the letter came and was read to the church. To so these purple people didn't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Disgusting. Continue. All the epistles basically either to the leaders of a church, responsible leaders in the church, or to the church. Now, think about the papal undertones here, okay? Um, the only way that you hear from God is when it comes from the leaders of the church. That's what he's saying. It has to be a written letter that comes in things like this. Um, you can hear from God, and it doesn't have to be written down as Scripture. We are bound to the Word of God. We, we read the Word of God. This is our standards. But God can speak to you individually. And you don't have to write the thing down and say, this is some kind of new Scripture. The Lord will deal with you on a personal level when you're saved. But not according to this heretic or according to the Roman Catholics out there. They teach that there's a church hierarchy, and the laity is subservient to it. That's why you can't be disconnected from the church. That's exactly what this man is teaching. Disgusting. I mean, just, you know, again, I wouldn't be so upset if the guy just came out and said, I'm a full-on papist, okay? I always have been. The whole thing's been a scam. We're just, you know. But these stinking Catholics are always infiltrating and getting in and, and putting their little poisonous doctrines out there. It ticks me off. I just don't understand how it is that the evangelical professing Christians have come to treat the church with indifference. It's just an evidence of the cheapness of their claim to follow Christ. Now let me just wrap up for this morning by giving you a few ways to see this. 
You may be ignorant of the church, and, and I'm helping to fill in some of the gaps in your understanding. You may have been indifferent toward the church, disconnected from the church, looking in but being outside because you're ignorant, you didn't know what your responsibility was. Um, See, you're just ignorant, Lanny. You have to come to a holy priest of God like this man. Sick. Absolutely sick. I hope I've helped a little bit with that. You haven't. You may be fighting against a desire to hide your life, which doesn't help you. Sin loves to have you alone. You may dread the responsibility that might be given to you because you're very satisfied to be doing the things that you want to do. Well, whether it's ignorance or whether it's a fear of letting your life be manifest, or whether it's not wanting to be given responsibility, whatever the reason, none of them are pleasing to the Lord. You are, if you're a true believer, you're the church. This, this isn't the church. This facility isn't the church. These buildings aren't the church. The people are the church. <laughs> See, you know, the people is the church, but the whole way through he's been saying it's the church, the building coming here. This is the church. Okay, there, Dr. John, uh, let's just destroy the church then because it's a huge waste of money. Just wreck the building or sell it or something like that. Um, just get rid of it and spend the money to feed the poor and have the church meet together in their homes and things like that. If it's the people, he's not about to do it. And your response to what the Lord expects of you in His kingdom can be laid, I think, hard on you with just some perspectives. First of all, it's an obedience issue. It's an obedience issue. The New Testament doesn't know anything about a person connected to Christ and not connected to the church. Absolutely. Absolutely. But see, he's changing and twisting the meaning of the church. When you're saved, you're in the church, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's not some place you come to, but he's saying it's a place you come to. When you're not around other believers, see, he said it's not the building. Okay, so let's just go with that for a minute. But you have to be around other believers and under the authority of a pastor to be in church. Last uh, Bible building I went to, I was told that a church is not two people. You have to have at least three. That's what he told me. Not fully connected to Christ and fully connected to the church. We are Christ's. We live in Christ. Christ lives in us. We live in the church. That We are the church. There is no separation. It's an obedience issue. Will you be obedient? Will you submit to those that are over you in the Lord? Ooh, submit to those that are over you in the Lord. You see it? The hierarchy. This guy's a Nicolaitan, and God hates it. Read back in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, where God hates the doctrines of the Nicolaitans, ruling over the laity. God hates it. And he's saying you have to submit to it. We're responsible to shepherd you and have to give an account to God. Will you be obedient to what the Lord wants? He wants you involved in His church fully. Secondly, it's not only an obedience issue, it's a fellowship issue. In Hebrews 10 it says, Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. There are some people who forsake the assembling. Why do we want to assemble? What's the point? He says that you might stimulate one another to love and good works and that you might encourage one another. Okay. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. Okay, here we go. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, ourselves, saved people, 
as the matter of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Okay? And then he goes down through. It's talking to saints in the time of Jacob's trouble. It's not even talking to Christians. But these people do this all the time. These Babel building people. They do this all the time. They'll always quote that scripture. Like if you have this somehow proves that you have to go to some building someplace called a church. It's ridiculous. Let's continue. So here's how fellowship works. It's not about what you get, it's about what you give. Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together so that you can stimulate others to love and good works, so that you can encourage others. You're not coming here to receive, you're coming here to give. This is where you give your life. Uh -huh. It's a fellowship issue. We need your spiritual gifts. We need you. We need your spiritual gifts. Did you get that one? Did you get that one? Nice, huh? You to be ministering the one another's, the several dozen of them in the New Testament. We need the mutual burden bearing, care, love, friendship, fellowship, communion, which is so purifying. Encouraging, upbuilding, uplifting, strengthening. It's a fellowship issue. Thirdly, it's an authority issue. Mm. I've already hinted at that, but it's an authority issue. You need to be trained, you need to be discipled, you need to be led, you need to be admonished, you need to be warned, you need to be reproved, rebuked, exhorted, instructed, edified. And there are men and women in the life of the church who have been given the abilities and the gifts to pour all of that into your life. Oh, men and women are to be teaching. That's interesting. Continue. To conform you to the image of Christ. You need to grow up into Christ, Ephesians 4. So that comes by being under the authority of the Word of God. <laughs> under the authority of the Word of God. What is the Word of God? He doesn't believe in it crazy. Paul says to Titus, speak with all authority and don't let anybody circumvent that authority because the Bible is absolutely authoritative. It's <laughs> the Bible is absolutely authoritative. Which Bible? What Bible? Show it to us. Doesn't believe it for one minute. He's a liar. It's an authority issue. Whose authority are you under? If, if you're in the cyber church world or if you're in the design your own religion on your computer world, you're under no one's authority. You're the authority. You're playing God with your own spiritual life. You need to be shepherded. You need to be nurtured. You need to be cared for. You need to come under the authority of faithful, loving shepherds and folks who care for your soul. Care for your soul. <laughs> yeah. What if they're not following Scripture? Well, you still should go and submit to them, so, you know, yourself to them. No, you shouldn't. If you're in this guy's Babel building, you need to get out quickly. Fourthly, it's an identity issue. It's an identity issue. Eleven times in Ephesians 1, we read, in Christ. Eleven times. But overall, in Paul's epistles, he uses that phrase, in Christ, 160 times. I could say it this way. There is no other phrase that so describes the character and nature of a Christian as that one. You are in Christ. You are inseparable from Christ. If you are inseparable from Christ, he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit, then you are inseparable from all others who are one in Christ. You are in Christ and therefore you are in his body along with all other believers. It's an identity. You, you bear His name. You literally are one with Christ. This is the mystery of all mysteries, how that the Lord could take us who are so unworthy and make us one with Himself. The church is, is where you live out that life in Christ. The Lord has brought you into the place where you literally share His life. He's in you, you're in Him. Like Paul says in Galatians 2.20, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. You are Christ's. It's not as if you're some kind of distant relation 
to Christ, you are in Christ. You are one with Christ. You might say a personal relationship with Christ. Well, that's right, though. We're not supposed to have that as, uh, you know, we're supposed to have, be part of a church and things locally. And... That is inseparable from Him. That is why the Bible, New Testament, uses the metaphor of the body. He is the head. You're the body. You're in union with Christ. How can you not be in constant communion with His living body, the church? Okay, then. The people should just move into this building. They should just live all together. Huh? See? See the problem? You're in church when you're in the building with the other people, but when you're outside of that, then you're not in church anymore. You understand. You see what's going on here. You know, somebody says, hey, I'm going to, from his Bible building there, they say, hey, i got to go visit some sick people. I have some people I need to go out witness to on Sunday morning. Hey, where were you? You weren't in church this week. That's exactly what would be said to them. You weren't faithful to the church. I had that thing put on me different times. I would not be there for a service. Oh, he's not being faithful to the church. It's crazy. And fifthly, it's a loyalty issue. You're called and gifted to show love and ministry to others. It's about loyalty. Are you so consumed with yourself that you have no thought of what gifts the Spirit of God has given you and what responsibilities the Spirit of God has laid for all of us so that you want to discharge that on behalf of others? The church is where you come to serve others, and in so doing, you're served. The church is where you come to serve others. See? It's a building. You come to it. You're not in it all the time. You come to it. Completely foreign to Scripture. You have no loyalty to your family? No loyalty to your people? come out of isolation. Love is, of all things, loyal. Loyal. And then, as I said, it's a ministry issue. It's a ministry issue. What's your ministry? What are you doing collectively with other believers to advance the name of Christ and the kingdom of God? What are you doing? When I talk about ministry, I'm talking about what the New Testament calls the fellowship of serving. It's endless here. The, what the New Testament calls the fellowship of serving. Okay, let's check this out. I'll do it over here so you can see it. Okay. Here. Ah, come on here. This thing is not wanting to. Grace. Okay. The fellowship of serving. He said what the New Testament calls the fellowship of serving. Sorry, no matches, matching verses found. KJV. Sorry. The fellowship of serving is not in your King James Bible. He just lied to you. Big surprise. It's absolutely endless. The ministries that go on here, the collections of people that are engaged in ministries 24-7 non-stop how are you engaged? How are you engaged in the fellowship of serving? So I'm talking to you about an obedience issue, a fellowship issue, an authority issue, an identity issue, one with Christ, a loyalty issue, do you, do you love the family, and a ministry issue. What are you doing along with other believers in a ministry advancing the kingdom? Okay, uh, show me a chapter and verse there where Paul said that we were to have a ministry advancing the kingdom. Okay, whatever. But, uh, you know, what are you doing? And things. Well, most of these people are doing nothing. I can guarantee you that. Back when I was part of Babel Buildings, it was like, come on in, you got to help clean the church building. You got to come in, you got to do this. We got to have the social, you know, dinner, and we have to have the couple's uh, Valentine dinner thing. We got to do this, and we got to do that. 
you spend all your time wasting your time with the upkeep of the building and doing little social programs there for the people completely foreign to the pages of scripture you get away from this system where you're bound to this thing then you can actually go out and start passing on tracks and witnessing to people and doing something for the Lord continue and then it's a truth issue number seven it's a truth issue people who jump around get a kind of a an eclectic understanding of truth people who are part of a church that is faithful to teach the Word of God get a well then he disqualified himself he's not teaching the Word of God doesn't believe that systematic understanding of the Word of God that's why we talk about so often the necessary expository ministry of the pulpit so that we're teaching you the Word of God in the same way that the Lord inspired the Bible. It's a book that goes from beginning to end and it reasons and goes through the logical process of unfolding truth. You can't hit and miss, pick and choose and get a cohesive doctrine. It's a truth issue. So you have to have cohesive doctrine? The whole way from Genesis to Revelation? Strange. In your church where you're committed and faithful, there should be continuity of teaching, integrity of doctrine, because obviously the truth saves us, the truth sanctifies us, the truth comforts us. It's the most important thing in the world. We don't want to be children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine because we're ignorant. It's a truth issue. And you can't find the truth until you're part of a church like His. Yeah. Lord can't teach you. And then finally, in my little list, it's an evangelism issue. It's an evangelism issue. You say, well, I, I talk to people about the Lord all the time. Well, I'm glad you do that. You should do that. But let me tell you what our Lord said about evangelism. Listen to these words. John 13, 34, a new commandment I give you that you love one another even as I have loved you that you also love one another now that's a high standard right love one another as I have loved you ask yourself how had he loved us greater love has no man than this that a man lay down his what his life for his friend so how did he love us supremely how did he love them that very night when he was headed to the cross he loved them by doing the lowliest possible duty, He washed their filthy feet. He loved them humbly. He loved them sweetly, graciously, generously, sacrificially. So the Lord says, this is the new commandment now. I want you to love one another as I have loved you. And then He says this, by this all men will know that you are My disciples if you have love for one another. So do the people... Of course, he's not quoting the King James Bible, some Vatican version, but uh, let's continue. People around you that are non-Christians know you love Christ because of how obviously you love His church. Is that defining in your life? Do you have to say to someone, I'm a Christian, you know, because they otherwise wouldn't know it because you don't have any visible, manifest life? in the church Ooh, so you have to go to some Babel building see it's just so warped it's it's like Catholic that's all I can think of it's just this Catholicism you have to be part of the church Christ's church how do you know someone's a Christian it's not because they say I have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ it's because they say I have a corporate relationship with Jesus Christ oh yeah so your salvation is defined by not having a personal relationship but a corporate relationship that is frightening talk about satanic heresy right there uh, no Jesus died for you for your sins and you have to come to him by faith without caring what anybody else is doing satanic heresy is spewing from this man's mouth. Let's 
continue here. Just about done. I love his church. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's my life, his church. You need to be a public, open, faithful member of his church for his glory in response to all that he's done for you. We're not perfect. We're not everything we want to be, certainly not everything He wants us to be. But we are committed to being an ordinary church, following the pattern of Scripture. Yeah, following the pattern of Scripture? Not on your life. He's not doing anything according to Scripture. Liar. Liar. The guy's a professional liar. That's what I'm saying. And you need to be an ordinary Christian, a part of the ordinary church. Father, we are grateful again this morning for a wonderful time of fellowship and worship. We thank You for the clarity with which Your Word speaks. Thank You for what You've done here in this congregation through the years, for Your blessing which has been showered on us. We don't want a personal relationship with you in any limited sense. That's not enough. We don't want a personal relationship with you in a limited sense. That's not enough. We want to be one with you and one with every other person who is one with you. We want to show the world the truth of the gospel and our salvation by our love for the church, which is the evidence of our love for the Savior. How can we say we love you, Lord Jesus, if it isn't obvious how much we love your church, the church you love and for whom you gave your life? And just let me show you the verse one more time. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. It doesn't say church. Okay. Now, I know that the body of Christ is the church. But again, see, he's inserting things into the text. He's having you believe it's the church and the church is the building. The place where you come to to, to congregate and things. It's just total satanic heresy. But uh, I'm going to end now and we'll go to the second part of this satanic nonsense. All right. Incredible.